Welcome to the Golden Age of Cardboard podcast, where we remember a time when stacks of cards were held together with rubber bands and Mickey Mantles were put in bike spokes. We hope you will enjoy and reminisce as you come along with us as we tell stories about the baseball cards from the Golden Age of Baseball. We will examine the state of the vintage baseball card market and talk to some of the greatest collectors in the hobby. You won't be hearing us talk about any chrome or shiny cards here. Now, to take you on this retrospective journey, here's your host, direct from the shallow end of the gene pool, my son, Mike Moynihan. Yo and hello everybody, Mike here. Welcome to another episode of the Golden Age of Cardboard podcast. I'm your host this week, every week. Really excited about today's episode. This is one of those like trying to schedule it. I really wanted to have uh, my guest on this week and we're actually recording this the day of release. So this will be released uh, almost immediately as soon as we get done hitting uh, end on the record button. But it we we were talking about topics. Uh, this is a guy that I've watched from afar for a little while and really respect how he hobbies and how he looks at vintage. And he's a vintage guy like myself, so this will be an easy conversation. And we found out we have a lot in common. We like each other. And so let me bring him on right now. Greg from Midlife Cards on YouTube. How you doing, buddy? Welcome to the show. Good. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the kind words. And uh you know, I think similarly, I've been watching you for quite a while from afar and um, really admire a lot of the things that you do and and produce. And so I'm really excited to be here. Well, it's awesome because we're going to do we're both music guys, right? So we're going to do a jam session. And if you, some people, some kids are like, I don't even know what a jam session is. Basically, it's just dudes get into the studio and just start playing random stuff. So we're going to jam on the 1950s, which is probably my favorite decade of vintage cards, the 50s. How do you feel about the 50s in, in general? 100% 50s is my favorite. Uh, it's the one I'm most familiar with. It's, I mean, I think of like, you know, the golden age for me. And you think of, you know, Mantel and Mays and Aaron and Banks and Clemente and all those guys our early to middle rookie cards this decade. Uh, but then earlier in it, you've got, you know, some Yogi Berra's, you've got some Ted Williams, you've got some of the guys that started a little bit before. So it really hits the heart of some of those superstars of that era. Yeah, it was, I think the fifties is so important to me because to me, it's the best decade of baseball that there ever was. And it's, certainly New York centric, like New York, if you watch the baseball documentary by Ken Burns, when he does the fifties, it's, it's so New York <laughs> focused. There were great players outside of New York, Stan Musial, like you said, Ted Williams, but New York was, you know, Jackie and Duke and Gill and Phil Rizzuto and Yogi and, and all the, all the teams in New York were so good. And they, you know, they were so dominant. And so it was the center of baseball, but it encompasses so much in the fifties. You've got, you're spanning a lot of guys that played pre-war, you know, or during the war. And then you've got this new crop coming in. Like you said, in the mid fifties, you've got rookie cards of Clemente and Banks and Koufax and Aaron. And so it's, it's this bridge, right? The fifties feels like a bridge in the hobby between the pre-war and the kind of getting into the, later vintage that golden age it's that's why it's the golden age right it's just it's well you know and, and you make it a really good point and it's something that i think a lot of us forget about which is you know a lot of these guys miss some prime years for being in the war and and you know you talk about you know ted williams for example has some insane numbers but he missed some really important years to statistically where he would have been absolutely in his prime. Yeah. And that's something that guys nowadays don't have to worry about because those guys did deal with it. 
you know, and so that's something that I think I, another reason I have a lot of respect for these guys is because they're like, okay, this is what the important thing is right now. I'm going to put my baseball aside. They went and did their duty and thankfully for all of us. And then they came right back and picked up where they left off. And, and that is even more reason to love some of these guys. Uh, Williams did it twice. Yeah. <laughs> like not just once, but yeah, twice. And was really good at it. Right. Um, let me now let me ask you a quick question because this is something I think about because guys our age, because we're fairly similar in age, like how do you start getting interested in guys from the 50s when they were done playing before we were born? Because like that's a big question I get a lot is what's going to happen to vintage cards, right? So yeah. it's like, and you're like, well, we'll always appreciate those guys because like you and I did. And so what got you into admiring those guys when it was players whose careers ended yeah. before you were even born? Ironically, just a few weeks ago, Andy and I did an episode on will vintage matter in 20 years? Will anybody care? And the answer is, of course it will, just like it does now. And for me personally, it was reading books when I was a kid about baseball history and hearing these legendary stories of players that I would, I never saw and would never see uh, the baseball documentary, which I watch every year uh, during the off season. It's kind of this thing that every time I watch it, I learn more and it came out, you know, early nineties. Um, and so maybe, maybe even late eighties. I can't, I wish I knew off the top of my head, when that came 91 maybe 90 something like that and it was a huge influence on me to i could see these that instead of reading about all these great legends and stories it was being able to now watch clips of these things and honus wagner and ty cobb and babe ruth and lou gehrig and all these guys that you know our parents or grandparents those were their idols right mm-hmm and I, I think no matter how many generations you get away from that, it still has appeal because they're still historic figures in the game. And if you appreciate the game and love the game, and I think for vintage, you have to love the game, really. Like you have to, to love vintage the way a collector should love vintage. I, I think you if you don't respect the history of the game and love the history of the game, you're going to be bored quickly uh, in vintage. But when you re, when you watch something on Fred Merkel and want to go, you know, you watch Merkel's boner or whatever. You're like, I want to, I want a Fred Merkel card just because that would be a connection to that story that I've heard that I enjoy, whatever. Uh, a book I would recommend for everybody is the glory of their times. Mm. If you haven't read that, Greg, you should, because it's a, you know, pre-war anthology through stories told by players and I'll tell you, I have the hard copy version and I've, I've only heard amazing things about the audio version because it's the actual interviews with the players. And this book was written in the seventies. So this was when these guys were still alive and this guy traveled around and found these players and, and got stories from them. So certainly a, a, a must read for anybody into pre-war, just wanting to learn more about the history of the game told firsthand by the guys that lived it. Yeah, I'll, I'll check that out. I, I just looked it up. It's 1994 that the okay, baseball 94. documentary came out. Gotcha. And and I think you're right. I think that documentary, I mean, I remember watching that and, you know, watching about the DiMaggio hit streak and how, you know, the hit streak was held by Wee Willie Keeler, you know, yeah. and that name is, you know, it's a noticeable name. And so I always had this thing for, we Willie Keeler. And so like recently I bought a T206 We Willie Keeler, you know, portrait card. And it's like one that I really wanted because as a kid, I remember hearing this name and he's who DiMaggio surpassed. And and so yeah, I think I think the documentaries and, and I think that we're really fortunate. We live right now in a time where you know Netflix and ESPN and a lot of these people are doing really, really cool um, documentaries and docu-series on different different historical figures, not just in baseball, but all over the place. 
and it's a and they're so well produced and it's really a great way so i don't know how much kids are reading books anymore you know i'm a big ted williams guy because in sixth grade we had to do a biography uh book and i chose one on ted williams and immediately was all in on ted williams and uh and so i don't know how much of that is going on reading biographies of old baseball players but i think people are definitely interested in watching a netflix series on some of those guys for sure yeah reggie has one out uh willie mays nolan ryan like there have been some really good ones recently uh, yogi yogi yeah just to learn like there were, i watched the maze one and there were things i just forgot or didn't even know at all and true with nolan and i followed nolan's career uh from the time i could i knew what baseball was you know he was around had been around when i started collecting in 81 and really getting interested in the sport so but i always learn something there's always something more to learn and you have to have that mindset too i think to enjoy vintage i think you have to want to learn more and I think that guys, and I've mentioned this on my channel before, but I think that a lot of guys are just wired to be interested in history. Like right. you think back to, you know, high school and a lot of our history teachers were like guys that were also coaches, like a lot of coaches are history teachers and guys just tend to be interested in history and war and how things got from here to here. And so whenever you have, that mixed with sports and then you start talking cards which is collecting and then you start mixing in money and finances with all of that it's like the sweet spot for for at least i think you and i yeah but we're not alone yeah uh, the thousands of people that listen to this podcast every week would tell you that yeah they think that way too mm -hmm. you know so uh that's <laughs> there's a lot of a secret people out there that love this stuff and and it's great we, we don't you know it's not on my facebook page ironically but it's it's kind of part of who i am to right. love history and stuff like that we got to dive into the 50s because let's do it we got to jam this out you know we got to have some fun playing some chords and coming up with some stuff so <laughs> the hobby 50s is also a really cool era because you have the first half of it dominated by uh, the Bowman tops rivalry and then the latter half tops takes over the world and and you get some really great sets there but let's start in 1950 Bowman is the only company creating cards in 49 you had leaf come into the fold and and they competed with Bowman in 48 it was just Bowman 49 leaf comes onto the scene one year wonder you know makes Bowman really change how they're doing cards they go from black and white to color in 49 uh i think in direct re retaliation response to leaf which has 48 copyrights so they knew that the leaf set was coming out in 49 and they go oh we can't do black and white anymore like we did in 48 we need to amp up our game we do 49 50 i don't know if i've never heard any legends about this or stories but was leaf potentially going to have another set so 50 bowman isn't the first kind of really uh black and white pictures that have been colorized by an artist and kind of painted by an artist to give you this full color rendition of a player in 1950 bowman versus the weird pastels that you get in 49 bowman uh, i i like 50 bowman a lot i think it was a kind of a groundbreaking set it's like okay new era of cards what do you like about 50 bowman so 50 bowman I, I'm, you're going to hear me say this a lot, um, but it might be my favorite set of the decade. And I'm going to probably say that about five times because I like so many of them. But, <laughs> the, you know, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, the 50 Bowman's not that great because the cards are so small and the pictures are so small. But to me, that's the character of it. Like, it, you know, we got these standardized size cards in the late 50s is when it kind of got standardized. And before that, you know, there's this variety of shapes, this variety of, you know, is it a square? Is it a rectangle? You know, and and part of the character of the 50 that makes me say I like it is because it's a, a square and it's smaller. It 
it shows its age and that character to it i love yeah. um so it, it's one of my favorite it's one of my favorites it if you were to ask me to write the second it would i would say it's my favorite the only thing that it's missing is it's the next year that a lot of the big names biggest names start showing up but sure. um the full color i mean i like 48 bowman because i like a lot of those rookie cards i like yogi berra but in 50 it really is a beautiful full color card um and it's not like you said the 49s that have the kind of partial-ish color um, but 50 is when it really it really started looking awesome um for for bowman for me you talk about the size differences and the variation of sizes that you see certainly through God, well, the whole decade, really. Um, and we'll get to the big cards in a minute. But what I think, if you're a vintage guy, one of the benefits of having cards that are graded is whether you're SGC guy or PSA guy or whatever, that standardizes the size of everything because the PSA slab, whether it's a 50 Bowman, a 56 tops or a 58 tops, all the same slab. And you don't yeah. have to, you don't worry about the size differences and man, do I have the right top loader or pages or binder? So if you're, if you're a car, if you're a slab guy, that issue of being annoyed with the different sizes goes away. And I don't yeah. think a lot of people think about like all my slabs are the same size, you know, unless they're tall boys, you know, big, bigger, bigger cards, but that's kind of cool actually. It's, it's really cool. And especially for those of us that are fairly OCD, we like things to be the same and we like, yep, yeah, we like things that line up perfectly. And so it, it is a big deal for us. I mean, you mentioned the tall boys. I've got a couple of late sixties uh, basketball cards and it's like, they're in a whole different area than the rest of my collection. Cause they don't fit. So, yeah, I mean, even the T206s and the Gaudis and stuff are in the same slab. And, and so that's really nice. But, but yeah, it, it is nice to have them all uniform like that. It makes me feel better. As we get into 51, we have Bowman. Uh, Tops comes on the scene with their first set. A lot of people don't even call those baseball cards. It's a, it's, it was a game and all this. I do. I actually like the 51 tops a lot. I think they're unique and different, um, but they're not bubblegum cards. I get that. But the reality is I think they're still cards. And so I, I love the 51 tops. Tops comes onto the scene. 51 Bowman, I think really, other than some key rookies, it feels like a layup by Bowman. They reused a lot of pictures from 50 Bowman. It's a, it, it's, feels lazy and that's true across the board right that's not exclusive to bowman in 1951 we see this by tops with pictures duplicating multiple multiple times throughout the 50s and 60s but 51 bowman is a great set because of the two key rookies but it really it's not that different than 50 bowman other than slight uh size change yeah, no, I hear, I hear that, uh, the, there is the size change, um, but the size change is bigger, uh, which a lot of people like. And I think the thing that maybe we take for granted, just me in today's day and age where it's so easy to produce, um, quality visual items that when you're having like a, an artist do a painting for a card. I kind of understand reusing an image. Now I wish they hadn't, you know, because, you know, like the Ted Williams is the same image. The Warren Spawn is the same image. A lot of them are, but I kind of understand why these companies would have done that. And it's the same thing later in, you know, 50 and 56 in some cases with tops, but I get it. Um, but I do think the size increase is an important evolution that, that Bowman did kind of take in, in that year. Um, and then again, there's, there's a couple of massive rookies and then some other, you know, decent rookies too. 
Right. Yeah, you got the Maze and Mantle, of course, in 51. Bowman, uh, the tops. Well, you got Monty Irvin. Uh, he has both a tops and a Bowman rookie. Uh, I, the tops card is one of those I really want to get. Maybe at the National or something. I just some 50, couple more 51 tops are... I'd like to add those. I've got the Barra and I've got I've got a few other Hall of Famers, but I love there, there's a there's a sneaky group of people who I think are kind of underground collectors of the red backs and the blue backs. Because if you get them at a show, a lot of the times you'll just find them really cheap. But if you look on like an auction site, a lot of the times they kind of start getting up there in price. So yeah. it's like I think there's a like kind of a cult following of those. Um, I like them a lot. I actually bought Amani Irvin at a show a couple of months ago. It was literally in a, there was a box and it was just by year and I'm going through them and I'm like, that's Amani Irvin rookie tops card of 51. And, and I do look at them as cards as well, not as a game. Um, and I like them a lot and I've looked to buy some more, uh, you know, the spawn, the, the bear, there's, there's, you know, it's missing some big names, but it's got a lot of good names too. Yeah. But if you try to buy them online, they get pretty pricey. Yeah. But it shows, like you said, you can find those. Uh, as we go into 52, we start really seeing the development and maturation of the hobby through the punch counter punch of competition between Tops and Bowman. You have Bowman puts out 52 Bowman, which is slightly larger than 51, but still smaller. 52 tops comes out. Whoa, these are huge cards with big pictures and great players and all this stuff. And the, and the competition heats up. Are you a 52 Bowman or 52 tops guy? If you were to have to choose one of the sets. I love both, but I would choose 52 tops because of how recognizable so many of those cards are. I mean, I could, I could in my, I, I mean, I could picture half the set, you know, like the Eddie Matthews rookie. I can, I can see it, you know, without even thinking. Um, but I also love some of these guys like Stan Musial, who I think is very underappreciated. I have no idea why, maybe because of the market he played in is a little bit smaller than New York, but He's got a 52 Bowman, which is a gorgeous card, and he doesn't have a 52 Tops. But as far as the design goes, I think it's different to what Tops did, and it's it's a huge step to where we are now, and so it's super important. Yeah, the whole what might have been, as you look at the Tops Bowman era of guys that are in one set but not in another, and how great it would have been to have them be in kind of all the sets it was just a different era of of contracts and that kind of thing it wasn't you know there wasn't a a union like they have now where they would have like in the 80s you know 83 you had a gwen tops you had a gwen donruss and you had a gwen fleer right? right all of them not true in the 50s guys would flip flop back and forth or you know cheat on each other by having both you know you guys had cards in both sets, etc. throughout the early 50s. But the old what might have, I mean, I, God, I think about how great a 52 top Stan Musial would look, right? How cool would that card be if they had done it? So, you know, kind of you can't go back and change it now, but I, I do think about that. Uh, and I'm a top guy too, by the way, on that year. Say that again? I'm a tops guy on that year. I would choose tops too. And in some cases, I think the Bowman is better looking. I mean, that's Minnie Minoso's rookie year, and he's yeah. got a Bowman and a Tops. Um, I appreciate the iconicness of the 52 Tops, but I think the 52 Bowman is a much cooler picture of him. It's a much more flattering picture of him. Um, and so I kind of pick and choose with specific players. If I were to have one, which one I would go. For me, the Minoso, I would go. I would go Bowman, even though I prefer tops for the year. That's fair. That's fair. So after 52 tops comes out, bigger card, Cyberger releases the iconic set. 53 comes along and Bowman, another counterpunch, right? They put out the Bowman color set, uh, followed 
later by the oh crap we run out of money bowman black and white set and then you have 53 tops one of the most beloved designs in all of vintage cards so what do you think about when you think 53 well again i i really like the bowman color set uh i i i love the pictures um you know again stan musual again monty Irvin. um there's some some really cool looking cards that year i mean there's a really cool pb reese card right um so there's some very cool cards that i wouldn't feel like my collection of the 50s is done unless it included some of those bowman colors but they almost feel to me like they're pictures they're like snapshots and they're not as um card they're not as card like whereas the 53 tops um i really like i do like the design i know some people feel they're a little cartoony um i don't feel that way you know i like the yogi Berra that year you know the short little bill on his cap and i like the phil rizzuto and i i like the whitey ford and i like the mantle and i like the maze like i like them um so if i had to pick one there i'm picking the tops but i think that the bowman is awesome it's just not as much like a card personally it's right. more like a some really cool pictures of the guys and a lot of the pictures are like kind of like it feels like it was like it's spring training and the guys were all just kind of hanging out pictures they aren't like poses as much there's some just cool hanging out goofing around pictures yeah definitely true i think 53 if you were to pick the best year of baseball cards in the vintage era, it's 53. Because both the Bowman and the top sets were fantastic, right? In other years where both exist, one set certainly outweighs the other to a significant degree. And 53, although it doesn't really have in either set any significant rookies, it is i think the best year of cards if i had to pick one year that i could only collect one year i would pick 53. Mm. um the, the only obviously there's no there's no ted williams cards in either set in 53. uh you have usual in the 53 bowman color so other than other than ted williams pretty much every hall of famer and star of the era is represented in one of the two sets or both and I, I wish Mays had a 53 Bowman color. How cool would that have card have been? You know, mm -hmm. um, Mantle has cards in both. So, you know, we haven't quite gotten to the to the next era of great players that are going to have rookie cards later in the decade. But I, I would pick 53 as the best year of cards, period. And you have my favorite card of all time, of course, the 53 Bowman color, Pee Wee Reese. So, so many people think that card is vastly overrated. And they're entitled to their opinion. I just think differently about that card. I think it was groundbreaking and different. And for that era, it was this action shot. And it's like, whoa, that's different. Exactly. It's it's a groundbreaking card. It's the first time it wasn't a pose like a picture we think of when we see old paintings of the Mona Lisa and stuff. It's like... Right forever it was the same thing and then there's that and it's like an a really cool action shot and it it think it changed things the other thing that's different about the 53 bowmans is it's the first time we started seeing multiple players on cards right right we had was in it uh rizzuto and barra in a card and no, rizzuto and, and uh no rizzuto and billy martin and billy martin had barra mano bauer right in the dugout there yeah. And so like that had never happened. I know that Tops did their first multiplayer card the following year, but that's kind of a new thing as well. So, you know, Bowman 53 Bowman did a couple of fairly important things that that you can see must have caught on because they start doing more of it. You know, both companies start doing more of it pretty much immediately. Again, punch counter punch, right? One company comes out with an innovation, the other company follows suit and usually one ups it. And then the other, and then they come up with something new and then the other company follows it. That's why I love, 
the idea of competition in sports cards, even today, like thinking about today, if we only have tops really with licenses, fanatics, whoever, whatever you want to say, is the innovation, um, what's the motivation for innovation versus competition being a great motivator for innovation and development? So, yeah. Well, you're talking to a pure capitalist here, so I'm all in on competition. Right. And, you know, another conversation I know you and I are going to have soon is on grading companies. And I am rooting hard for multiple grading companies to continue to thrive because it's going to force each other to be cheaper, to be better, to be faster. And if they don't have that competition, there's no incentive to do those things. Right. So 54, uh, 54 tops, great year of cards. Absolutely uh -huh. gorgeous. Um, Both sets again are great years. Are great yeah. cards. I prefer the top significantly over 54 Bowman. I just finished my 54 Bowman run of Hall of Famers with, I just got to Larry Doby uh, recently and finished that out. I, I'm going to put them all together. I'm going to, I'm going to reserve judgment till I do my showcase and I get them all out. I think I'm going to be more appreciative of the set when I see them all together, but uh, which is so much fun, by the way, to do that, to get all the cards from a certain year or a player and put them together because we don't get to see that a lot unless we intentionally do that usually you know you'll look at a certain single card or whatever but 54 tops is so cool greg i mean I'm just... it's it's so cool and i think one of the reasons it's so cool my all-time favorite card which i don't have um is the ernie banks rookie card it is my favorite card and it in how can that you not have your favorite card how can you not have your favorite card? <laughs> It's, it's, this is going to sound awful, but I don't have it because I think it's overpriced. Okay. I mean, if you look at Ernie Banks cards, if you look at his 55 and 56, they, they're much more in line with what, what other comparable people are at. Now, I love Ernie Banks. Ernie Banks, to me, you look at Ernie Banks and you go, he looks like the nicest person. He's got this big smile. He's always, even late in life, he was at the park a lot. And you just see him out and about. He looks like this great guy. And the thing I love about that particular card is he looks like he's about 16. And he looks so happy. And it's this cool face shot. It's got the old, you know, Cubs logo. But it's so, it's a really expensive card. And I don't want to, I don't think I want to buy it until I have the one that when I look at it, I'm like, that's the one. And I don't know what grade that would be, but it's not going to be particularly cheap. Right. So I will have it. I just don't yet. I got gotcha. you. Uh, the big innovation for me in 54 is tops puts multiple pictures on the front of a card. You know, it's mm -hmm. not just one picture of a player. It's two, you know, two for the price of one. And I love that the, the headshot, the action shot. Uh, I, I love that about 54 tops. You've got three key rookies, Aaron may or Aaron banks and K line uh, 54 Bowman. And, no and all rookie. three of those rookies, the pictures are awesome. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, but how cool a shame Bowman didn't get those guys. Cause how cool would it be to have a 54 Bowman Hank Aaron, you know, uh, but you do have Manol and Mays in the Bowman set. The Bowman set is full of great players. No doubt. It's, it's a, and I like the design. I mean, even the Dobie that you did the video on the other day, it's just a cool picture. He's kind of lounging there. He's just kind of hanging out. But I like the, you know, the cursive name across it. And it's got, it's adding some different elements to it. Um, and I, again, I think that, I, and something I, you know, I'd be curious on your take on is Bowman's are so much more affordable than Tops. And I know that Tops is a recognizable name, but Bowman is still around, you know, it's, it's still around now. Um, why are the Bowmans of pretty much all of these guys like 
so much cheaper than the tops when in a lot of cases the bowman card is is really cool i mean the 54 bowman mantle is a really cool card you know it's just um, demand. and it's his only and it's its only card that year yeah it's just demand you know um i don't know how else to describe it people just prefer the tops and they're not you know again buy what you want but i just think more people gravitate towards the tops cards if they're going to do a player run or just to get a key card of a player they're going to choose the tops but bowman's are getting there like i think people it's it's there's kind of this you know um rejuvenation of of enthusiasm for the bowman early 50s bowman cards and i, I think we're seeing that in the hobby yeah, I hope so, because I think they deserve it for sure. Well, it's probably a direct correlation to this show. <laughs> <laughs> but I did do yeah, I, know whole, you, I know you like the Bowmans a lot. Well, I did a whole series on every Bowman set, you know, not yeah. too long ago. And and just to, to give them more recognition, uh, to have a revival in interest in the Bowman cards, because they are great and a great affordable uh, choice between Tops and Bowman. Moving to 55, wow. Um, last year, Bowman. Tops changes the game again and says, we're going horizontal, guys. But so does Bowman, right? They they both go horizontal for 55. Mm -hmm. The TV set, 55 Bowman. Uh, it's a it's a love it or hate it set, I think, for a lot of vintage collectors. A lot of, a lot of guys love it. More and more are loving it, but plenty of guys still just dislike the the design where do you where do you sit with 55 talk to talk well to. i love the 55 top set um you know two of the coolest looking cards you know in the whole decade are i mean i love the kofax rookie yeah um i i really like the clemente rookie the only reason i don't say i don't love it is because i like the 56 better than the 55 okay but i i really like the set um and and I think that I, I, I'm not a fan of the 55 Bowman set. I know you like it. So this would be an easy choice between my favorite. It would definitely be the tops. I respect the 55 Bowman set, but it's not my thing, especially because I like the 55 tops a lot. And that's fair. I mean, I would still choose the tops too over the Bowman if I had to choose a set that I wanted for myself. But I, again, I, the more 55 Bowmans I get in my collection, the more I dig it. And I just, again, it's grown on me over the years. And, uh, you know, you'll mature as a vintage collector. Don't worry. <laughs> well, down. I think, I think, <laughs> I think part of it is because the TV border is so big that the image takes up a fairly small, you know, comparatively a sure. fairly small percentage of the actual card you know in most of the years so it's like you know you take a look back to that 53 bowman color set and it's pretty much the whole card is the image sure but in that set it might be or that card it might be like 70 60 to 70 percent of the card is actually the image in the 55 bowman so i don't feel like you get a very good look at any of the guys in the pictures Right. That, that's fair. Fair criticism. <laughs> You're just wrong. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> and I know I, I'm bummed that that was the end. You know, I'm bummed that Bowman didn't have a chance to redeem themselves. <laughs> so from what I have heard, um, 56 Bowman was on the table to be released. It was in the design of what ultimately became the 58 hires root beer cards, the knot hole type cards. That was going to be the 56 Bowman design. They obviously went out of business and that set was never produced or released. So we get tops. Tops is now king of the world in the vent in the bubblegum card world, demanding kids, nickels and pennies. And they didn't hit a layup. They hit a home run with 56 tops. It's, a striking design, beautiful. What do you think about 56 tops? Yeah, I mean, I mean, mantle's back and it's an awesome mantle card. I know a lot of people don't like the coloring that looks like he has lipstick on or something. I I love that mantle. That's probably my favorite mantle card. 
the action shot in the background. He's like going over the fence for a catch. You know, um, a lot of the action portion of the card are better. Like the Clemente, the Clemente is a really cool action shot again versus the 55 where it's, it's just like swinging. Um, so I said earlier, the 50 Bowman might be my favorite. The 56, the 56 is right there. The 55 yeah. and 56 are right there, but the 56, especially, um, I just bought a Ted Williams not that long ago from the 56 set that you know, I, I love, I love the color. I love the design and I feel like they improved the action shot of the card in most cases over the previous year the only bummer and you called it a home run and it is a home run but the only reason it's not like a grand slam is because they reused so many pictures from the previous year so many of the portraits are not only maybe the first time they reused it multiple times they i mean the For aaron sure. image the aaron is the same image from his rookie you got 54 55 and 56 are all the same portrait headshot basically but then you have some guys where it's different, like the Koufax. I really like the 55 Koufax portrait, but the 56 Koufax portrait, I think, is inferior to the 55, but they didn't use it. Right. Yeah, Go. who knows what the thinking was other than, I don't know. I, I wish I could be in that room with those guys deciding how to how to make that set. But, you know, and it's, a lot, it's the last real time we see Jackie. Um, it is and, jacket, yeah. and it's that's that's a really i like the 55 jackie over the 56 because there's something about the yellow background and it really captures the the portrait better of him in 55 than 56 to me but um and i, I believe it's the same image for the portrait for both years but um so that's another reason it's an important set is because it's the last opportunity to get one of the most important and collectible players, right. you know, ever. Yeah. It's the last year for Jackie, for Feller, for Rizzuto. Like you have a lot of, uh, Pee Wee Reese's last card, I think it's 56. So there's a lot of guys that that's kind of the end of their card story. Right. And that makes that set even greater for those reasons. As we go into 57, 58, 59, I want to talk about kind of those three years kind of all together because you you, you get a standard size for cards that they still use today. 57 introduces uh, actual photographs instead of painted photographs. You know, we get color photos for the first time on cards and, and for the first time in tops cards, I should say, because 53 Bowman color is obviously color photos. But you, so you you have that with tops going forward 58 59 of those three years where do you gravitate towards in terms of favorites yeah my favorite in those three years would be 58 um i feel like the colored background makes the the pictures pop a little bit better um i like the bold name stands out a little bit better um i'm not i'm not huge on the 57 uh on the 57 set personally um, I, it, the, the standardization, it's an important year, you know, like you just said, with the pictures and the standardization of size and stuff, but it's just not, it, there's nothing, uh, that really jumps at me about that versus the 58. I mean, there's so many cards in the 58 set that, you know, like the 58 Aaron is in my opinion, the best looking Aaron card. Um, there aren't a lot of cards. I look at the 57 set and go, well, that's the best looking one. Like they're all kind of, they're okay. Um, there's, I think a lot of very undervalued cards in the 57 set. Um, maybe the most undervalued card, which I don't understand again, like you said, demand, but is the Frank Robinson rookie in a 57 set. Um, but the 58 would be my favorite of those three. Can uh, you for name sure. 57 so critical you have five hall of famer rookie cards can you name yeah. all five okay drysdale yep bunning frank robinson mazeroski and uh, i'm gonna and i'm missing an easy one i'm missing a layup aren't i you're missing a layup yes he shares the last name with one of the players you already named 
Oh, Brooks Robinson. Another yeah. one of my favorite cards is Brooks Robinson's card. Cause again, I like the cards of the guys when they look really, really young. Yeah. Uh, when I was a kid, so my dad, my dad and I would go to shows, you know, from the time I was like 11 through, you know, 18, we went to a lot of shows together and he was a vintage collector. He built the 59 and 60 set. And I could tell you some great stories about his 59 and 60 sets. Uh, but I always used to point to three cards to him as my three favorite cards as a kid. And they were always the 48 Yogi rookie because I love Yogi. Just I've rode in elevators with Yogi. I've interacted with Yogi multiple times. And he's such a sweet person and he's such an iconic figure. So the 48 uh, Yogi was one of my three. The Brooks Robinson, the 57 tops, which I almost forgot. Well, you helped me. Uh, and then obviously the Ernie Banks rookie, those three cards. And then the Brooks Robinson and the um, Ernie Banks, I love how young they look. They yeah. look like kids. And that is a different time in baseball than now where kids coming out of high school look like grown men. And they usually go through the minors for two, three years, just doing fundamentals and stuff. Rarely does a kid get straight to the majors, you know, by the time they're 20. So this is a time where these guys were going straight in. They were super young. I mean, K-Line, K-Line you know, yeah. what, that's another one. And it's like, these guys are so young. And I love that about some of the cards from this decade, which we start to see less of as time goes on. Yeah. But um, well, somebody told, so. somebody corrected me one time. I think that there's another rookie from that year, but he's in the Hall of Fame as a coach. Herzog. I can't remember. Who is it? Whitey Herzog. There you go. And I, I needed to make that caveat. People are going to be like yelling at their at their car radio, like or on their iPhone, listening to this. Like, what about Whitey Herzog? I was talking the five players that, <laughs> and Herzog was a player at that time. But I'm saying sure. that made it in the Hall of Fame as players, not as managers. But Herzog has a rookie card as well in '57 tops. For me, the the I like the '59 the best, honestly. Uh, I, I kind of like the multi-design, the, the circle, you know, uh, it's another case kind of, you could make the same argument about 59 tops as you do 55 Bowman, that the design takes up more of the card surface than the picture itself. And that's not necessarily a good thing, but I just, I, I think it's just a fun set, the circles. And I really like it. I like the, um, the images are good in it. The only great rookie card in 59 is the Bob Gibson, but man, what a great one to have, right? Uh, the yeah. Pepto-Bismol card is fantastic. Uh, 58, you really only have Cepeda. So to me, the 57, it, just with all the rookies that are in it is, is a pretty significant set design, not, notwithstanding, uh, it's incredibly simplistic, obviously, from a design standpoint. I do I do like the different, the nameplate being, you know, sometimes multicolored. And so that, I kind of dig some of those cards, like the Duke Snyder and the Roy Campanella. And there's some great cards in 57. But, um, yeah, I'd, I'd pick 59 out of those three if I had to choose one just based on design. If I had to choose one based on significance, I would choose 57. So there's mm -hmm. just different aspects to look at these cards. It doesn't have to be just, I like the way the cards look. Wow. What does this set mean in the, in the annals of the, of the hobby, you know, too. So, and, and I know you're, I know you're a hall of fame collector. I get yeah. that. Uh, but there's also another rookie card in 58 that a lot of us Yankee fans are pretty high on. Um, so, well, 57 okay. has uh, Bobby Richardson. 58 would be, Who's in 58 that's a rookie? Oh, Roger Maris, of right. course. Yeah. No so that's, I mean, again, not a Hall of Famer, but a really important player of the era. And um, no doubt. one of the things I've seen recently, uh, somebody asked me the other day, you know, what cards do you think are hot right now? Like whose cards? And one of the cards that I've seen showing up in cases more recently is Roger Maris. And I don't know if it's because of the Aaron Judge, you know, home run thing kind of brought him back 
into like talking about him and stuff sort of like when you know uh you know a few years ago when McGuire. McGuire broke his record and this you know the thing about that was so cool about that is that his sons were showing up to the games and his one of his sons looks exactly like him right so it was so cool to see that but it just uh, maybe that's the reason that his name he's been showing up more but i feel like i've seen more cases with maris cards and people buying maris cards than in previous you know back in the then historically great point um as we finish up here, Greg, what, first of all, thank you for being on the show. Thanks for jamming with me, uh, on the 1950s. Any final thoughts you want to throw out there about the fifties in general? I mean, I would, I think the one thing I would say is, uh, don't sleep on the Bowmans. You know, I think, I think a lot of people out there are so fixated on tops that they're overlooking some really great cards and some really great sets. Um, I think that, you know, tops not having Musial or um, Ted Williams for the early 50s, well, for Musial, most of the 50s, but um, it's an opportunity to get cards of those guys um, that are a couple of the best players of all time. So I would just, I think my final thoughts would be to anyone out there listening, you know, look at the Bowmans because they're, they're, a, a percentage of the cost of the tops and there's some really cool cards and there's some players that you could only get their cards if you go with the bowman yeah great sentiments uh i appreciate it greg uh great debut on the show good job <laughs> well i appreciate you having me i've watched you for a long time and truly it, it really is an honor to be on your show well my honor as well and to all you guys, I hope you have a great rest of your week, great weekend, and as always, keep collecting. We'll talk to you soon.